On March 26, 2000, the Russian Federation held presidential elections. The winner, Vladimir Putin, would go on to rule and transform the world's largest country, and continues to do so to this day. In Russia today, the clear winner of the Russian presidential election, Vladimir Putin, began to establish the Putin era. Vladimir Putin, the career spy, talks about establishing what he calls a dictatorship of the law, fight corrupt bureaucrats, and strengthen the central government. But those who elected Putin didn't realize how large the ideas of Russian philosopher Ivan Ilin loomed in the new administration's political ideology. Although Ilin had been dead since 1954, Putin was keen on reviving his ideas and putting them front and center in his political program. Ilin lived through the 1917 Russian Revolution, which ushered in the Soviet Union and one-party communist rule. But he was no communist. He was a Christian fascist, inspired by Adolf Hitler and Italian fascist Benito Mussolini rather than Lenin or Stalin. Exiled from the Soviet Union in 1922, he began conceptualizing his ideal version of a right-wing Christian dystopia in Russia, which he thought would follow the inevitable collapse of communism. Ilin's ideal Russia would resemble the fascist states of the 1920s and 1930s. The anxieties of a population demoralized by harsh socioeconomic conditions would be channeled into glorifying a redeeming, savior-like leader who promised to defend the nation from external threats, whether or not those threats really existed. Violence would be glorified over reason, and propaganda would triumph over rational discourse. But Eileen went a step further than the one-party fascist states in Europe at the time. He thought that even one real political party was too many. A multi-party system might be useful in order to justify the ritual of holding elections, but all real power should be invested in a man, not a party, and this man would be in charge of the government, judiciary, and armed forces. Ilin's writings on his ideal Russian fascism had been banned and dormant for decades, but with the liberalization of Russian media in the 1990s, his books again began to circulate. And after Putin's election in 2000, this accelerated. Ilin's books were recommended to school pupils, and Russian civil servants were given copies of his complete writings. Putin even arranged the transport of his body from Switzerland for reburial in Moscow in 2005. For Putin, implementing Ilin's vision of a right-wing dictatorship in Russia has proven successful. But to discover how we got there, we must go back to the tragic events of September 1999 three months before Putin would be named acting president of Russia upon the resignation of Boris Yeltsin. In September 1999, a series of bombs went off all over Russia, culminating in 293 deaths. At the time, Putin had been prime minister of Russia for only a month, but his response was swift. He ordered troops to attack those he deemed responsible, terrorists from Chechnya, a region in the south of Russia where protracted civil war and insurgency had been raging for a decade. It marked the beginning of his implementation of one of Ilin's key concepts, namely of uniting Russians in the face of hostile agents threatening the country's existence. And it worked. In August 1999, the relatively unknown Putin's approval rating was just 2%. But three months after launching the Second Chechen War, it had shot up to 35%. This prime minister, most people don't even remember his name. And suddenly he comes on television and he says, we're going to hunt down the terrorists. And we're going to wipe them out in the outhouse. And in March 2000, with the war still raging, Putin was elected president of the Russian Federation. So began Russia's transition to Ilin's politics of eternity. Central to this was Putin's new propaganda master, Vladislav Surkov. He was particularly gifted at exploiting manufactured crises to tighten Putin's grip on the reins of the Russian state. He began to think that everything can be manipulated. Any kind of press, any TV program is all about manipulation. It was decided what TV channels would show what news. In 2002, for example, Surkov used a terrorist attack on a theater in Moscow as an excuse to place major television networks under complete state control. Years later, after the economic downturn of 2008 and 9 had hit Russia particularly hard, independent observers suggested that Putin's party only won about 26% of the vote in the 2011 parliamentary elections, with citizens seemingly hoping for political change. 
However, official results listed the party's vote share at 49%. The results were obviously faked, and widespread protests ensued. It was in this context that Putin identified a new permanent enemy to exploit for political purposes, the West, represented by the United States and European Union. State television began broadcasting that anti-Putin protesters were being paid by Western organizations. First and foremost, the United States has overstepped its national borders in the economic, political, and humanitarian spheres it imposes on other nations. Well, who would like this? Who would like this? To supposedly safeguard Russian sovereignty, Putin began cementing Ilin's philosophy into Russian political life. FSB officers were now allowed to shoot people without consequence. Libel against the government was made illegal, and foreign NGOs in Russia were either banned or forced to register as foreign agents. With these draconian policy changes, Putin had successfully implemented Ilin's dream of a Russia governed by the politics of eternity. After World War II, a defeated Germany and a declining France decided to integrate themselves to ensure their own survival in a post-war world. The eventual result was the European Union. Up until 2013, Russia had stood out as the only European post-colonial power that had not considered joining the EU as a way of maintaining its waning world power status. Instead, Russia saw itself as the EU's equal and sought a strategy of peaceful coexistence. But after the fraudulent elections of 2011 and 12, the EU was now depicted as an enemy attacking Russia's sovereignty. Therefore, in 2013, Russia adopted a radical new course. Instead of Russia becoming European, Europe should be made more Russian. All of this was summed up in 2012, when Putin publicly announced that Russia would pivot its foreign policy goals toward the creation of Eurasia, a political union that would compete against the EU for dominance. Less publicly, Russian authorities began putting a plan into action that would help Putin achieve his Eurasian ambitions, the destruction of the EU from within itself. But unlike his traditional war against the enemy in Chechnya, Putin resorted to covert measures to destroy his European enemy. Cyber attacks were employed by Russian government hackers to spread propaganda. In April 2015, for example, a French television transmission was interrupted by a video message purportedly from ISIS aimed at spreading fear amongst the general French public. And this fear had consequences. Two years later, French far-right candidate Marine Le Pen's Islamophobic and anti-immigration platform managed to secure 34% in the presidential election, a record high for a far-right candidate in post-war France. Meanwhile, in the United Kingdom, Russian internet trolls sent millions of anti-EU messages out to British voters, and at least 419 pro-Brexit Twitter accounts were traced back to the Russian government's internet research agency. On June 23, 2016, British voters decided to leave the European Union by a margin of 52% to 48%. Russia's new anti-EU foreign policy was proving successful. Amid Russia's efforts to get the EU to destroy itself from within, a problematic scenario was developing closer to home. In 2013, Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych was close to signing an association agreement with the EU, making Ukraine's ascension to EU member status much more likely. However, the agreement would also have constituted a severe setback for Russia's Eurasian ambitions. So, on November 21, 2013, immediately after having a conversation with Putin, Yanukovych went back on his promise to sign the agreement. Soon afterward, protests erupted across Ukraine that would go on to change the country forever. Although demonstrations initially revolved around the signing of the association agreement, they took on a different nature after riot police attempted to violently disperse protesters. The protests suddenly became about Ukrainian dignity in the face of oppression. As if to emphasize this point, on December 27th, Russian intelligence agents arrived in Ukraine to help suppress the protests. By January 16th, 2014, it was clear that Yanukovych was in Putin's pocket, as he instituted a number of dictatorial laws identical to those passed in Russia two years earlier. Then, on January 22nd, two protesters were shot dead 
a glimpse of the politics of eternity and the violence and repression offered by Putin's Eurasian expansionism outraged Ukrainians who gathered across the country to demand Yanukovych's resignation. Realizing that their covert actions had failed, Russian leaders scrambled to implement Plan B, destroying the foundations of the Ukrainian state and making it as hard as possible for the country to further align with the EU. Soon, the same internet research agency that fueled the fire of Brexit began spreading disinformation on supposed Ukrainian atrocities in the southern region of Crimea. Less than a month later, Russian snipers shot and killed almost 100 Ukrainian protesters. Yanukovych's remaining political support evaporated, and he fled the country to join his Russian handlers in Moscow. Moving developments in Ukraine after those deadly protests, the government firing back. The president tonight is in hiding, and just look at the images coming in now. Families wandering the grounds of his luxury home outside the capital today, taking turns playing on his private golf course, helping themselves to his golf clubs. And now the former prime minister is now free from prison where the president had put her, reaching out to her supporters right there. Four days after the sniper massacre, Russia invaded and occupied Crimea, and within three weeks held a staged referendum on whether the strategically important region should break away from Ukraine and join Russia. The result was unsurprising. Crimea became part of the Russian Federation. Months later, after fresh national elections were held, Ukraine finally got its association agreement with the EU. But now that it was a divided, war-torn nation, further integration into the EU had been greatly complicated. Putin had scored a half victory. Russia's next step in destabilizing Ukraine was military intervention on behalf of pro-Russian separatists in Ukraine's southeast, which Putin justified with propaganda that portrayed ethnic Russians in the region as victims of Ukrainian oppression and Russia as their liberators. Even more unbelievable assertions of victimhood occurred after July 17, 2014, when Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 was shot down by an anti-aircraft missile, killing all 298 people on board. All evidence clearly indicated that Russia was responsible. But while international condemnation of Russia ensued, Russian television claimed that the plane had been shot down by a Ukrainian missile intended for a plane with Putin on board in an attempted assassination. Their conclusions, the missile could not have been fired by Russian or separatist forces, but instead came from an area controlled by Ukrainian government troops. The missile itself was an old model, they say, no longer used by the Russians. It wasn't the murdered innocents and their families who were victims. It was Putin and the Russian nation who were under attack by European powers. <laughs> I personally have no doubts that it was an operation which was planned by Russian special services to bring down Malaysian Airlines civil plane flight MH17. Meanwhile, Putin used propaganda internationally as part of a campaign of strategic relativism, which reasons that if you can't eclipse your adversaries via direct warfare or economic might, you can at least weaken them in order to gain relative power. This was the case in Germany, after Angela Merkel pledged to take in half a million refugees in 2014. Three weeks after her announcement, Putin intensified airstrikes in Syria to generate even more refugees seeking to settle in Germany. He hoped this would lead to a rise in anti-immigrant sentiment and boost far-right populists such as the Alternative for Germany Party, or AFD. All of this was accompanied by a disinformation campaign to frame refugees as rapists and criminals. For example, a Russian-German teenager was reported missing for 30 hours in January 2016. Upon returning home, she told her mother that she'd been raped by three refugees. A medical examination disproved her story, but state-run Russian television and statements from the Russian foreign ministry still created a media storm blaming Merkel's refugee policy for the incident. German right-wing groups also demonstrated in the streets demanding justice. Despite being a fabricated story, it helped weaken Merkel's grip on power as her party lost 65 seats in the 2017 election, and the AFD obtained the third highest number of votes, marking the first time a far-right party had entered parliament since World War II. After Putin's successful intervention in Brexit and half-victory in Ukraine, his attention turned toward the ultimate prize, the downfall of the United States. 
Russian hackers began breaching high-level American networks in 2015, including the White House and State Department. But it wasn't until 2016 that Putin would use cyber warfare with the explicit goal of remaking America in Russia's image. He would accomplish this by catapulting Donald Trump into the White House, covertly supporting Trump both financially and politically. First, he needed to make sure Trump had enough capital to run his presidential campaign. In 2016, Trump's real estate holdings suddenly became very popular with buyers. In the six months before his election, nearly 70% of units were bought by shell companies, many of which would be traced back to Russian oligarchs. The man known as the Russian Potash King, Rubyovyev, purchases a property for more than twice what Trump had paid for it. Did he overpay uh, because Mr. Trump was such a great negotiator, or was there something else going on? Never does anything with the property. So the property transaction appears to be nothing more than cover for infusing a cool $100 million into Trump's bank accounts. With Trump's campaign funds secured, Putin then needed to make sure that his army of hackers were doing all they could to tilt the race in Trump's favor. This was the most aggressive and most direct and most assertive campaign that the Russians ever mounted in the history of our elections. And what characterized this were the variety and intensity of the techniques that they employed. On the eve of the election, Facebook closed 5.8 million fake accounts, whose sole purpose had been to spread propaganda on behalf of Russia. And on Twitter, thousands of fake accounts spouted anti-Hillary Clinton propaganda. But perhaps the most infamous example of Russian's election interference was the publishing of Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta's hacked emails. 30 minutes after the release of a bombshell audio recording in which Trump bragged about grabbing women by the pussy. Grab them by the pussy? <laughs> I could do anything. Russia released the torrent of emails aiming to distract the public from Trump's campaign difficulties. When we went into the convention, we had to contend with that first drop of emails. Just that DNC employees... These Russian actors, they were in communication or in touch with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And then they published that data in a way to help Trump and hurt Hillary Clinton. And Russia's disinformation campaign eventually proved successful. Trump was elected president on November 8, 2016. With him in power, the United States' move toward the politics of eternity accelerated, sinking it to Russia's level and validating Putin's strategic relativism.